In this video, I'm going to be teaching you about cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF. I'll discuss what it is, what is the functions of CSF, how do you obtain it through a lumbar puncture, how is it valuable in making a multiple sclerosis diagnosis, and if you stick around to the end, I'll discuss future utilization of CSF as a biomarker to assess MS function. If this sounds like something you want to learn about, don't go anywhere, because that learning starts right now. Howdy! Learn about MS with me, Aaron Boster. I started this channel to help my own MS clinic patients learn between visits. It's my hope that through these videos I can help you learn too. I use easy to understand language to bring you approachable and accurate multiple sclerosis education. So if you're impacted by MS and you want to up your game, make sure to subscribe to the channel right now. Also ring that notification bell so you're alerted to all of our upcoming content. What is cerebral spinal fluid or CSF? CSF is a clear liquid or fluid which bathes the brain and spinal cord and also courses inside the brain and spinal cord. So I'll throw up a cartoon here and what you see is inside of the brain and spinal cord are some caverns or spaces in the brain those are called ventricles. And cerebral spinal fluid is made by specialized cells on the surface of those ventricles called the choroid plexus. Now the choroid plexus uses blood to create CSF. Um, it's not exactly filtering the blood, but conceptually we might think about it that way. And this clear CSF fluid flows, as you can see, inside the brain through the ventricular system and then outside the brain to coat the surface of the brain and spinal cord before it's reabsorbed back into the blood system. What are the functions of cerebral spinal fluid? Now, in reality, there's a bunch of functions, but I want to focus on three. Number one, CSF provides a buffer or a shock absorber. Number two, CSF delivers nutrients to the brain and spinal cord. And number three, CSF clears away metabolites and waste products from cellular activities. How do you obtain spinal fluid? Commonly, spinal fluid can be obtained through a spinal tap or a lumbar puncture. So here's a cartoon of two different ways of obtaining spinal fluid. In both positions, you get the patient to curl up in a ball, like in the fetal position either laying down as you see, or my preference is to have the patient sitting up, leaning over a table. You prep their back by cleaning it off in a sterile fashion, and obviously we use lidocaine or some other anesthetic. And then we insert a super small, thin needle, as you can see in this picture, through the tissue and the ligaments into the spinal sac, where we can then draw out clear cerebral spinal fluid. One of the risks of a spinal tap is that of a lumbar puncture headache because you punch a hole in the sac that the fluid is collected in and that hole will seal itself the same way that when you cut yourself it'll heal itself but if it doesn't close right away when you sit up and you have that column of fluid and a hole at the bottom it'll leak out inside your body and if that happens you'll get a whopper of a headache now the headache is positional so when you lay down flat your head doesn't hurt anymore and then when you sit up and it starts to drain again it starts to hurt there are specialized needles that we use preferentially to minimize the risk of a lumbar puncture headache and yet it can still happen and so if it does happen let me give you three tips to make it better as fast as possible tip number one is to lay down flat now, laying down flat is not a lazy boy recliner. I'm talking about flat, because you want to remove gravity, which is pushing that fluid out of you. Number two is to drink lots of water. Drinking water increases blood volume. Increased blood volume results in increased production of spinal fluid, so it'll more rapidly replace the spinal fluid that you're missing. The third thing is to drink more caffeine. Now, caffeine increases spinal fluid production. One more note, a lot of people are concerned when they have a lumbar puncture that we're gonna drain all their fluid. Please keep in mind that an adult human has 150 cc's approximately of spinal fluid. And you make that five times a day. You make a lot of spinal fluid. It's constantly being made and reabsorbed. When you do a lumbar puncture, oftentimes, diagnostically, you're taking out 10, uh, 11, 12 cc's, a very small amount. And so you're gonna make that back very quickly. My point here is there's no risk that we're going to drain the fluid out of your body. 
So now let's focus our attention on spinal fluid as it relates to multiple sclerosis. Now, upwards of 90% of people impacted by MS will have changes in their spinal fluid, which reflect the fact that they have an overly active immune system in the central compartment. So that manifests in two ways. The first one is what's called an elevation in the IgG index. IgG is a doctor word for antibody. And one of the ways that an overly active immune system manifests is you make a bunch of antibodies. So when you draw out spinal fluid, you can measure the number of antibodies or the amount of antibodies in the spinal fluid as compared to the amount of antibodies in the bloodstream. Now under normal circumstances, there should be way more antibodies in the bloodstream as compared to the spinal fluid. In, a, in an inflammatory condition like multiple sclerosis, you have more production of antibodies in the spinal fluid. And so that ratio will be different. And so an elevation in the IgG index is suggestive of inflammation, which can be seen in MS. The second is to see unpaired oligoclonal bands. That's a mouthful. So when you talk about an antibody, that's a protein. And there's a special technique when you collect the spinal fluid and when you collect blood that you can run it out on what's called a gel electrophoresis. And up here I'll put uh, an example of gel electrophoresis. And you see that there are lines. Those lines are called bands. And they represent uh, areas where there's protein. And some of those bands correlate to antibodies. And when you look at oligoclonal bands, you do a comparison of the CSF against the serum. And if you see bands that are in the CSF not seen in the serum, these are called unpaired oligoclonal bands. And they teach you, just like with an elevation in the IgG index, that there's an overly active immune response, an overly active inflammatory response in the central compartment. Either of these two findings, elevation in the IgG index or the presence of unpaired oligoclonal bands, is suggestive of multiple sclerosis. When you're trying to diagnose a human with multiple sclerosis, whether that be primary progressive MS or relapsing forms of MS, it turns out that spinal fluid can assist in clarifying that diagnosis. And I'll start talking about primary progressive MS. PPMS requires two criteria. The first one is a year of insidious decline in neurological function. The second is to have supportive evidence, and you need two of three possible pieces of supportive evidence. One of them is an MRI of the brain with at least one classic lesion. A second option is two spinal cord lesions. A third option is to have positive spinal fluid, meaning spinal fluid with unpaired oligoclonal bands or an elevation in the IgG index. So, if you have at least a year of insidious progressive decline in neurological function, and you have a brain MRI or a spine MRI with those characteristics, the addition of positive spinal fluid is adequate to diagnose PPMS. For relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, if you have someone who has suffered their first event, their first clinical event, we call that clinically isolated syndrome, CIS. And after an episode of CIS, a brain MRI and spinal fluid can help clarify the diagnosis. So if you have a clinically isolated syndrome, and I'll use the example of an optic neuritis, and then you have a brain MRI that shows spots in different locations, that gives you what we refer to as dissemination in space. Now, in order to make the diagnosis, traditionally, you need dissemination in time, which can be accomplished by having a second clinical attack, or by having a second MRI with a new spot, or that same original MRI with enhancing lesions that don't explain the condition. But with the 2017 revised criteria, we can now accomplish so-called dissemination in time with spinal fluid. What that means is, after your first event, and I use the example of optic neuritis, you have an MRI of the brain that shows spots in classic locations. If you add spinal fluid that's positive, that's adequate to make the diagnosis. It's important to point out that spinal fluid is not prognostic for disease activity. So the presence of abnormal findings on spinal fluid does not predict a worse MS outcome or anything like that. However, there's some very, very exciting research 
that might help us provide a CSF biomarker specifically to look at response to therapy and the current activity of MS, even subclinical, meaning you haven't manifested uh, new symptoms, but your disease is active inside. And I'm talking about neurofilament light chain. Neurofilament light chain is uh, created with axonal destruction. And so when you have inflammation and it, it breaks down the parts of the axons, some of that debris uh, goes into the spinal fluid. And it can be picked up with testing if you've done a lumbar puncture and collected some of that spinal fluid. Now the literature on this is fascinating. And what it looks like is elevations in neurofilament light chain correlate with disease activity, even subclinically. And this is not yet prime time, but I truly believe that in the near future, we will be able to do a lumbar puncture on a person with MS and based on their neurofilament light chain have a very, very good indication as to whether or not they have active disease. And this might provide uh, another measure in addition to the MRI to guide us in our treatment decisions, which is really very exciting. So there you have it. A quick didactic on cerebral spinal fluid or CSF and how it's utilized in the setting of multiple sclerosis. I hope that you found this helpful. And if you did, please feel free to give this video a like. If you have questions or comments, I would love to hear them. Please put them in the comments below and I assure you that I'll get back to you within 24 hours. Once again, my name's Aaron Boster. Thank you very much for learning about MS with me. And until my next video, take care.